Welcome to part two of our field studio guide. In part one, I covered what gear is needed to get you started and some useful upgrades on the basic kit. If you missed that, click the link in the description and check it out. In this video, we're discussing how to achieve clean studio results out in the field. Now, it's important to reiterate this is with the primary aim of being able to capture natural subjects whilst minimizing, or ideally eliminating, any disturbance to the natural environment and any distress to the subjects we're studying. Okay, let's remind ourselves of the basic setup and start to look in detail at how this is achieved. You have a subject with a white background, preferably backlit, and another light in front of your subject to fill in the shadows. Let's build the set piece by piece. We'll start with plants as they're less prone to running off the moment you get close. I've chosen a blackthorn in bloom for my subject and I've specifically chosen a plant out on the edge of the field so as not to disturb the surrounding area too much. Lone subjects are not always available, but you should actively seek them out if you can. If there are surrounding plants around, then take care not to crush them. And gently hold other stems out of the way with a simple weight such as a stone, so that they can spring back when you depart. First thing you want to do is take a simple ambient light test shot of your subject for framing and composition. Use the focal length and focus distance you'll be taking your final shot with. Including the subject in their natural environment will not only allow you to work out where your background needs to be, but also gives a record of the environment and can create some stunning additional images for your efforts. If you have one, plonk your camera onto a suitable tripod to keep that framing. Next, position your background material so that it fills your frame corner to corner and is perpendicular to the lens to give even lighting. I'm using a sheet of 3mm opal acrylic available from most sheet plastic suppliers. You then position your flash so that it's firing through the diffuser and into the lens. We're opting for backlighting for convenient light positioning and light efficiency to prevent your background flash from having to work too hard, but also to allow you to show any natural translucent properties in your subject to better describe their form should you choose to do so. Importantly, you don't want the flash right up against the background if you can help it. Some distance between will allow for a more even spread of light so you don't get dark corners and a bright hotspot that causes you headaches with correct exposure. If you can, adjust the flash zoom position so it covers the material beam. Just do this by eyeballing it. If in doubt, stick to around 30mm. To get this exposure right will depend on a number of factors, mainly the amount of light your diffuser transmits and the power of your speed light. So there's a bit of trial and error, but remember, not only on the flashes, but also on camera, we're working in manual here. So once you've got this, it will stay at a fairly consistent level for most solid subjects. You want your background to be blown out or overexposed, but not so bright that you get flare and blooming haze from your background. So tweak until it's only just over by about half a stop. To demonstrate here, I've dialed in 1 8th power on this speed light when using F11 with a 200th of a second at 100 ISO. So we're not really stressing the speed light at this point. And that's giving me an even exposure, which I can check with the blinkies on my rear screen of my camera. You then position your second light as close as your framing will permit. So you get a nice soft diffused light rendering the details without harsh shadows. Obviously, if you're going for a less documentarian and more artistic approach, you can use smaller light sources and harder shadows to bring out your textures. With all lighting, we're just seasoning to taste here, but the diffused shadow would allow for clear rendition of detail. Again, tweak this exposure by adjusting power on your fill flash to get your desired end result. Just ensure that you're not blowing any highlights out with the fill flash. Taking a test shot with just the fill allows you to check this and, depending on positioning, can give you a nice alternative take with a dark background. So if you've got the hang of this and you're producing nice clean images of flora, you may well find that you get some fauna companions as a happy byproduct. As in this test I took of a weed with a little green orb spider companion who spent a happy 20 minutes modelling for me as she smothered the plant with her silk threads. However, catching images of creatures intentionally, from invertebrates to small mammals and amphibians, requires equipment a little more specialised and, important to stress again, great care not to cause distress. If you have no experience handling wild creatures, it is vital to follow common sense and guidance from the countryside code and from nature charities. You can find invertebrates by turning logs and stones, but take great care not to destroy the environment by searching for them. Careful use of a jam jar and a small soft paintbrush or a butterfly net can help minimise damage. Also make sure that you set up your lights and your set in advance of searching for your subjects, preferably in the shade, and don't keep the creatures for more than a few minutes at a time. The set I have here for animals is fairly straightforward to construct with readily available materials. If you want to find out how to put one together yourself, check out the provided link. You position this in the centre of your set and you can either place it face up for shooting down on creatures or on the side for capturing profiles. You may find that for top-down shooting that a large reflector or diffuser placed on the ground and lit from above 
actually does make life a little easier in this situation. For side-on subjects, the set is virtually identical to the plant set. You just need to ensure that your background is large enough that it covers the whole set in case you have mobile subjects keen to explore the whole range of motion available to them. The last thing you want to do is place them in an unfamiliar environment and further distress them by repositioning multiple times. So there we are, some tips on how to get your studio out on location. You're not limited to a field, obviously. Anywhere you can find flora and fauna is an opportunity to explore a different way of doing macro photography that really lets the subject speak for itself and hopefully allows us all to learn a little bit more about our local natural environment. I hope you found this helpful. Check out our blog at wexphotographic.com and don't forget to subscribe for more great videos.